storage on a whole, your rent that you're getting from tenants is collateralized by their stuff. And people don't like to get rid of their things. So, you know, in an economic downturn, let's use 2007, 8, 9 as an example, there's a significant amount of downsizing happening, right? So people are going from, you know, maybe a house to an apartment or a larger apartment to a smaller apartment. All of those kinds of change create demand for storage. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. Hello and welcome to episode 232. One of the asset classes that's expected to hold up well during this coronavirus pandemic is self-storage. In fact, it tends to do well no matter how the economy is performing. Today, we're going to take a look at the factors that make self-storage so attractive and help you understand how to successfully invest in this sector. And here to take a deep dive into this strategy is Chris Benson the Chief Investment Officer for Reliant Investments, a subsidiary of Reliant Real Estate Management, which is one of the top 25 commercial self-storage operators in the U.S. Reliant has completed over $650 million in self-storage acquisitions and dispositions in the past five years. We'll also be discussing what it takes to put together a $50 million fund and Chris's role in raising money for Reliant's portfolio. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. And I hope you're right about self-storage performing well in all economic conditions. We'll find well, out in about 90 days. Yeah, you're right. We are recording this uh, May 14th of 2020. Uh, we're right in the kind of the thick of the pandemic, and uh, but states are starting to open up. So we'll see what happens. And I do want to talk about the recession resistance ability of self-storage uh, during this conversation. But Chris, first, I want to learn a little bit more about you. Tell us about about you and how you got started investing in real estate. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm married. I have a beautiful wife and two children, a little bit older. Um, I have a son who'll be 19 next month and a son will be 14. And um, interestingly, my background comes from a sales background. So um, I worked in a, a variety of different sales capacities coming out of college, um, most recently with um, Intuitive Surgical, which was the manufacturer of the Da Vinci robot, which is a pretty incredible technology if your listeners are familiar with it. And um, essentially what happened, Brian, was when I was about 30, um, I distinctly remember waking up and saying, boy, I don't think I can do this another 30 years. Um, how am I going to replace my income? <laughs> Um, I, I was doing well in all traditional metrics of success, of making much money and you know getting promoted and having great jobs. Um, but um, you know my my issue was sort of the, the work life balance and the time piece. And so for me, real estate was sort of that path that I saw that brought I guess individual freedom um, to the table, where I could see a path that got me to replacing of income and then ultimately controlling my own time. Um, And as opposed to, you know, spending my time making money, allowing my money to make me money. So uh, we started on a path that uh, many real investor, real estate investors do. We, uh, we started with uh, duplexes in the town that we lived in the county we lived in. um, And we built up a a sizable portfolio of duplexes and um, I hated it. It was not my favorite at all, Brian, to be honest with you. Um, (laughs) It, it, one, it was very challenging to see it being scalable. um, And two, I really just didn't like dealing with the people. Um, we, we had kind of class B minus C plus type properties. And um, we were just sort of in a, always seemed to have drama somewhere. And, and it was just a nightmare for us. So, um, you know, we looked at that and there was a podcast or a, a, something I read and I wish I could quote who said it, but the quote was, you know, big deals and small deals are the same amount of work. You just make less money in small deals. And, you know, that was sort of a light bulb moment for me where I said, okay, if I'm going to spend enough time and I still had a full-time job, if I'm going to spend all of my waking hours doing this, um, one, I want to be enjoying it. And two, I want to be maximizing, you know, the potential income that could come from it as well. And so we ended up selling the portfolio of um, duplexes and made a little bit of money. Um, and I wanted to get into multifamily 
And how that started was I actually called um, a construction firm, the guy I'd gone to church with, and I hadn't talked to him in probably 15 years and said, hey, uh, his name is Steve Buck. I said, Steve, I want to build some apartments. Uh, I got a little bit of money. What can we do? And long, long story short, that went, uh, that's got us started on a 64 unit ground up development um, that we ended up building in a town not too far from where I grew up. Um, and that was where the light bulbs went off for me, Brian, just understanding how scale of commercial real estate worked. Um, and then fortunately, I had a very good partner that helped me understand the value could be created in a ground up development. And so um, we went on and invested in a fair amount of um, uh, multifamily properties across the U.S. First, you know, the idea was to do it actively. And then secondly, um, when I realized I could do it passively, that made a lot more sense to me partnering with you know, professional organizations that ultimately were going to know more and be better than, at it than I was. And so that was the path that we took. Um, and then kind of fast forwarding to how I got to self-storage uh, about three years ago, well, probably closer to four now, um, as cap rates in multifamily have gotten more and more compressed and it was harder to find value in that space. I said, I'm going to start looking at some other asset classes and um, I can, you know, we don't have to go through it now, but I can certainly tell you the data I use that helped me find self-storage. Um, but I really liked the attributes of self-storage as an asset class and just started interviewing operators um, that uh, I thought I could partner with from an equity side of things. And um, Reliant was one of those. And so I was an investor first and then that relationship grew over time and they needed some help uh, building out a equity platform, which I had had some experience with. And so, um, you know, we, we formed a partnership about two years ago and uh, we've been with them ever since. So that brought me into self-storage. Let's talk about why you transitioned then from multifamily to, to self-storage. Uh, first of all, do you still have a lot of that multifamily and how is it performing? Well, the 64 unit one I do. <laughs> we still we still own that. Um and as as of May 14th, we're doing pretty well. April's collections, we collected 100% of rents there. Um, May, as through last week, we were down about 12%, but it uh, looked like we had line of sight to another 100% payment. I'll tell you tomorrow. We have a, a call with the property manager. <laughs> I'll let you know where we stand on that. But so far, so good. That, that thesis that we went into that market with um, has held strong. And then I have a few still passive investments um, where I'm just a, a passive money investor in um, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth area. And, and those continue to perform well um, as of right now. We've exited all the other positions um, at this point. But, you know, the reason kind of why, um, I guess, transitioning to storage was um, some of the operators we were working with essentially said, we're done. We're, we're going to wait until there's a correction because, cap rates have gotten to a point where we don't, it's very, very challenging to find value in the market. Um, and I'm sure many of your listeners have seen that in the last, you know, call it pre COVID the last three years, it's been really challenging as there's just been so much capital chasing those deals. And so, um, you know, I knew that if, if I wanted to have a, uh, a runway of, of additional growth, I was going to have to, you know, find something where there was still value. Um, and really, Brian, there's there's three reasons that that self storage made sense to me. And I'm a data guy, so I like to to validate my thoughts with what that what the data says. Um, this particular data set, and I'm happy to send you the the link that you can put in the show notes. But it's the National Association of REIT Data, and essentially what it does is compare all. You can see anything that is a publicly traded REIT. Um, and compare it uh, subspecialty by subspecialty. So, you know, if there's a timber REIT, you can compare that to how apartments have performed. And they have data for, you know, at least the last 20 years. So storage, uh, historically, the, the REITs did just under 17% a year, which is incredible, right? Um, multifamily, which I kind of thought was the gold standard, had done just over, just under 13%. Um, and then if you look at the other major food groups, retail office, um, they also performed in and around where multifamily was. So, you know, upfront storage performed, outperformed some of the larger asset classes. Um, the second thing I like to understand, I'm a believer that everything that has happened before is probably going to happen again. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the data from 2007, 8, and 9, the last downturn, you're going to be able to see how that asset class performed. Um, storage lost less than 4% of its value um, in that same data set um, comparatively to where apartments were, which it was closer to 7%. 
you know, retail and office got hit a little bit harder. Uh, you know, obviously the S and P 500 during that time frame was down 21%, something along those lines. So not only did it have this historical performance of really outperforming or outperforming, but also in the last downturn, it did really well. So um, those were the two starting points. And then as I did a bit more digging, Brian, the last thing, and this was, you know, more for me, um, was there's a consolidation opportunity. So the ownership in self-storage is very fragmented. There's five publicly traded REITs that many of your listeners already know. Um, you know, CubeSmart, Extra Space, Public Storage. Um, if, if any of your listeners are in the car right now, just look out the window and there's a pretty good bet you're going to see one off one of the highway F exit ramps. Um, but they own about 20 to 25% of the market. And the rest of the self-storage ownership is very fragmented. So there's a, there's a really nice consolidation play to be had in the marketplace. Um, and so for me, that was the runway that I saw to say, okay, you know, if we're going to make a transition in investing in storage, then I want to make sure there's, there's some um, runway to do it with. And, and I found it here. What's your feeling on the recession resistance of self-storage? Do you believe that it does well during any economic condition? And why is that? Well, historically, I would say the data would suggest, yes, it has. Um, you know, what we're seeing now is sort of an unprecedented event compared to other financial um, downturns. So we'll see how it is impacted by COVID-19. Um, but, you know, storage on a whole, it, it's interesting, right? Like your rent that you're getting from tenants is collateralized by their stuff, right? So they put their stuff in a unit. And if you don't pay their rent, if they don't pay their rent, we auction the unit. And I'm sure your listeners have seen this show Storage Wars. It's kind of made the industry somewhat famous, I guess. Um, but so they're, they're collateralized by their own stuff and people don't like to get rid of their things. So, you know, in an economic downturn, let's use 2007, 8, 9 as an example, there's a significant amount of downsizing happening, right? So people are going from, you know, maybe a house to an apartment or a larger apartment to a smaller apartment or they're getting um, relocated for their job, or maybe they lost their job. All of those kinds of um, change create demand for storage. Um, and so, you know, in an economic downturn, we may not have the opportunity to grow, um, you know, physical, or uh, I'm sorry, rents, where we're not able to raise rents, but physical occupancy typically performed really well. With this particular crisis, Brian, so far, so good. Um, April's revenues, both in our own portfolio here at Reliant, um, and if you look at some of the national data from the REITs, um, April did really well. The first part of May, collections look strong. Um, you know, in the next two weeks here, we may have a different story to tell as people have, you know, um, less income to, um, to pay those rents. But I think the crux of it is, you know, in a downturn, you see a lot of change. Change creates demand for storage. And ultimately, people don't like to get rid of their things. Through Reliant, uh, your, your company, what are you guys targeting when it comes to self-storage? What are you looking for uh, in acquisitions? And, and what's some of the upside that you're able to achieve? Well, I, I think our strategy has um, really been built around secondary and tertiary markets, right? So we can't compete. Our cost of capital is too high to compete and call it you know, the top 50 MSAs. You're never going to see one of our stores in Manhattan, LA. Well, I shouldn't say never, <laughs> um, but most likely probably not. You know, we're we're competing definitely in the secondary and tertiary markets, um, and and our sweet spot has really been value add um, on the self storage side. And you know, Brian, coming from the multifamily background and you on the residential side, you know, it's not like we're going in and adding granite countertops and hardwood floors and stainless steel appliances, right? It, it's a garage, so we can't really do that. Um, but the thing we can do is we look at every property through the lens um, of the exit. And you know, probably more than 80% of our properties have been exited to a REIT um, on the back end. And so there's a quote unquote institutional type product um, that we're trying to build in every one of our assets so that if, if we wanted to sell it to one of the REITs, we have um, a property that they'd be interested in buying. Um, sometimes that's expansion, right? Where we go in buying a cash flowing asset and we're going to build an additional, you know, 15, 20,000 square feet of climate control buildings. Um, sometimes that, that value add can be a lease up where the previous owner did the expansion and we'll take it over at certificate of occupancy and then we'll lease it up. 
Um, sometimes that value add is just running it professionally. Um, you know, I, I told you that there's a significant number of mom and pop type operators in the space. And, and what I would define a mom and pop operator is one, they own one or two facilities. Um, and many times they, they just haven't run it professionally. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but things like rental rate increases, late fees, um, you know, U-Haul truck rentals, those are all ancillary income items that, that are low hanging fruit. Um, that we look at for every property and bringing those to the table. So our, our definition of value add can be different based on every project we do. Um, we look at each property opportunistically and then try to make the best decision on where we think we can make the biggest impact. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property Property manager interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. What you're looking at when you acquire a property is the exit. Can you sell this to a REIT or a larger institution? Um, what are some of the thresholds that you look at that says, okay, this is a, an asset or this is a property that we would be able to do that with versus that we don't want to touch this because it doesn't fall mm-hmm. into those parameters. What, what are those parameters? So I think a, a big one in the beginning, Brian, is size, right? So, um, you know, typically we're shooting for, I would call it either 30,000 net rentable square feet or more, or with an opportunity to expand. Um, you know, most of the facilities, the average net rentable square footage of a facility in the United States is somewhere in the 50,000 range. Um, if you look at some of the stuff that's been built in the last three years, sometimes that's even larger, 80 to hundred thousand square feet. So typically the REITs are not going to go into, uh, you know, 15 to 20,000 square foot kind of think first generation self-storage, you know, the whole facility's out in a rural area on a gravel pad behind a fence. They're not, they're not interested in that typically, um, unless it's a market that may be in a path of progress. So, you know, the size is is usually our first indicator. Um, For us, Brian, we're vertically integrated. um, So we're managing as well as buying. So one of the things we're looking at is location compared to the rest of our portfolio. So if we're going to deploy individual people um, and parts of our operational team there, we want to make sure that, um, you know, it makes sense geographically to have people there. So that's another one for us. You know, most of our portfolio is in the Southeast. Um, and if, you know, if you showed us a property in Indiana, uh, it would be challenging for us to go into Indiana and in one particular property. If we could come in at a portfolio, maybe we could make it make sense, but, um, geography is another. And I think, you know, back to your question about some of the things the REITs are looking at, you know, they're looking at many of the metrics that, um, you would look at in any asset, asset class, traffic count, you know, supply in the market, what, what other competitors are, um, around that space population growth, job growth, um, you know, average income, you know, renters versus owners, the things that you'd look at to, to try to understand what the demand may be in that particular marketplace. What's your feeling on um, indoor climate control versus outdoor drive up? Do you have a preference for one over the other? Or is it just a matter of what's what is the demand in that area? Yeah, I think it's probably more the latter is it's market specific. Um, you know, here in the Southeast where we have really humid um, summer months, you know, typically the drive up units, you want to be thoughtful of, you know, are you going to create mold or mildew on the, in the uh, drive up type of unit? Um, but there's still definitely a market for that. Um, but it really is, we try to look at it market specific and then also the, the competitive set in that particular marketplace. You know, we may go into a tertiary market where, you know, the competitive set is all drive up. Um, or non-climate controlled. And maybe there's an advantage to be putting climate controlled units there because there isn't much choice for the consumer. And then we may go into another market where, you know, there's, there's a ton of climate control options. And so if we're going to do some sort of expansion, you know, maybe there's not enough drive up option. Uh, certainly the, the cost of the non-climate controlled for consumers typically less. Um, but, you know, it's for a specific use where they may not be concerned about 
you know, moisture, those kinds of things. Can you define for our audience what you mean when you say tertiary market? I'm talking to you today from our office in Roswell, Georgia. So Roswell is about 20 miles north of Atlanta. You know, I would say that, you know, if you think of Atlanta as a primary market, right? So that's from typically defined by the number of people who live in that particular area. Um, so Atlanta may be a primary market, you know, Buckhead, for those people who are familiar with this area, Buckhead is a, a, a huge suburb of Atlanta. That's definitely a strong secondary market. And Roswell, which is a small town, kind of a, um, a, uh, a sleepy suburbia, um, that may be considered a tertiary market, right? So it's, it's primarily based on population, you know, population size. Um, and sometimes for us, what we found in these tertiary markets is there's significantly less competition, which makes sense, right? You don't have the big institutional investors or the REITs coming into those spaces um, because that's not where the people are. And for us, you know, sometimes there's value in going into these markets because there's less choice for the consumer. And so you have a, a much more stable cash flow. And then Chris, when Reliant acquires, a, say, a mom and pop facility in a tertiary market, what are some of the management efficiencies you bring to that, that product? It depends. I hate to give you that answer, but um, you know, I'll give you a quick example. Sometimes, as I mentioned, sometimes it's just about managing the property professionally. We, we had a facility we bought outside of Tampa last year um, that a, a gentleman and his brother built it in the late 90s and did a fantastic job. A beautiful site on a great location and, and the market grew around them. And um, they had never raised rents on in-place tenants and they owned it for 20 plus years. So if, if you rented a unit in 1999, you paid the same dollar amount that you paid day one. Now, they raised rents on new people coming in, um, but you know that's, that's not market rate, right? So sometimes it's just about bringing people to market rates. You know, the other one that we talk about a lot is, is having a retail component. Um, so in all of our sites, you're trying to build a retail office that, that looks and feels like any retail, you know, well lit, really professional, safe um, as you walk in, smells good. We try to have cookie trays or cookie, cook, um, like little cookie ovens in each one of the facilities. So, you know, you walk in and it smells like chocolate chip cookies. That That's a nice touch. Um, and in there, we're selling things like boxes and locks and moving blankets and, you know, essentially all the things that moving and self-storage would require. Um, U-Haul truck rentals is another one that people don't seem to like to do. We're one of the largest U-Haul dealers in the country other than U-Haul themselves. Um, so we don't own the equipment. We're just um, a, a leasing agent for U-Haul. And then we get to share and our investors get to share in the, the commissions of those, um, of those rentals. So, you know, things like that um, are certainly helpful. Um, and then obviously we can scale, you know, our marketing, uh, our digital advertising, things that maybe one individual site can't do, but with the scale of us as an operator, we can plug them into the platform that we have. Hey, I'm wondering if you can take us through maybe some of your rules of thumb when it comes to what you'll, you'll acquire a property for as far as uh, cost per square foot and, and what you hope to sell it for later on to the, to the REITs per square foot. And, and then also, if you get into construction, what you would typically expect to spend per square foot to build, say, indoor climate control versus uh, non-climate control. Unfortunately, that answer is a really big depends. <laughs> it really depends on the markets that you're in, um, especially on the construction side, right? So in some market, you might be, you know, $100 a square foot all in, including the land costs. Uh, you know, if we were in a really strong secondary market, that number might be $120 a square foot, right? It really depends on the labor costs, materials, what's happening in that particular market, the cost to acquire the land. Um, as far as what we sell for, all of these properties um, are, are valued on income, right? So it's all based off of NOI and then whatever the associated cap rate is. And, and we've seen cap rates come down, um, you know, in the last, it, certainly the last three years, uh, cap rates have compressed as more capital has started to chase self-storage for the reasons we started with, because people believe that it's recession resilient. So if we, as we've gotten later in the cycle, there's been more capital chasing these types of deals. Um, so unfortunately, I, I probably can't give you a great answer is like, hey, we're trying to buy it, you know, $75 a square foot and sell at $125. It, it's really based on the business plan. I mean, there's, there can be some that we're buying, 
you know, far below replacement costs, you know, $80 a square foot, but we're going to put a few million dollars into it um, in capital expenditures to create that value um, that we're trying to back out of, you know, that we'll exit on in the future. So really how our underwriting team works is, you know, they'll look at a particular property, come up with a business plan, and then validate that business plan with the numbers um, to see if, you know, we can get to the returns that ultimately our investors are going to require us to. And, and what I would say, Brian, is, you know, we're underwriting deals based off what we think we can sell to our, or what our investors' expectation is, right? So if we had investors who said, hey, I only need 5% cash on cash return a year, well, we could buy a lot of stuff. Um, but, you know, that's not where the market is today. So what we're underwriting to is where we say, okay, if, if we buy this property, are we going to be able to take this out and raise equity to have investors come along with us? Now, you were saying that you came on board with um, a Reliant in order to help them build their equity platform. And, and for the, those who raise money from investors, including myself, who syndicate or, or uh, put together funds, I, I'd like to dig into that a little bit. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping you can kind of give us a blueprint for how uh, Reliant works with investors and, and how you are able to help them build their equity platform. I, I don't know if I can give you an exact blueprint, but I can tell you kind of what's worked for us. So if you think about the spectrum of raising capital, right? And, and on one end, you have um, institutional capital. And on the other end, you have individual high net worth accredited investor kind of capital you know, there's advantages, distinct advantages and disadvantages to both. Let's start with the institutional capital. So let's talk about like a Blackstone, right? Or a BlackRock, like big global asset management firm, you know, money is not an object, right? They can deploy hundreds of millions of dollars. In fact, most of the time, their minimum investment is going to be 50 to $100 million for it to be worth their time. Challenge with those is they own all the leverage, right? So Basically, they write the check and say, Reliant, here's what you're going to do. <laughs> and we say, yes. <laughs> um, they, they usually have the control, right? So um, they're going to have major voting decisions as far as um, do we want to refi, do we want to sell? They're going to control those timelines or certainly have an influence over that. Um, and so, you know, there's advantages. The advantage is they can write big checks, though, right? So if you have a portfolio you're trying to buy or go out and consolidate a marketplace, that's where that helps, right? On the other side of that spectrum is individual accredited investors, right? So think, you know, um, doctor, lawyer, business owner who has some additional cash that they're trying to deploy and diversify out of traditional investment vehicles, you know, some non-correlated type assets, which real estate fits the bill. There, it's a pain in the butt to collect a lot of money because <laughs> you're doing it, let's say $50,000 at a time, right? So, you don't have the ability to collect big checks all at once, but the leverage is back to the operator, right? Where we can dictate terms and say, look, if you're going to participate with us, here's the terms in, in which you can do it. Um, so, and, and from a control standpoint, the control lies with the operator, right? So those people are coming in as truly passive investors and they're trusting our experience as an operator to deliver the return. And they really have, and I, I don't mean to sound crass when I'm saying this, but they have no control over the, the investment. Essentially, they come in, we tell them when it's time to sell, and you know they get a check and hopefully we, we've delivered the returns we've projected. So I think the first thing you need to decide is you know, where you are as an operator. Um, and you know, if you're gonna go out to like a BlackRock or Blackstone, you gotta have a pretty substantial track record and have scale for them. If your goal is to raise capital with individual accredited investors, um, that's a different, I think, marketing strategy. Well, I'm guessing Reliant brought you on board to help them decide what does that equity platform look like? So I'm curious, mm -hmm. what, what direction did you go? Did you go with the larger institutions or the, the more silent, passive, accredited investors and, and why? Or actually, I think you just said why, but which one did you go with? I, I would say my goal is to have all, <laughs> right? I, Look, and it starts with what your goal is. And my partner, Todd Allen, who's the managing principal here, his goal is growth. And so, you know, if, if you put too many eggs in one basket, let, let's use the institutional, for example. If we go out and raise capital strictly from institutions and they control our destiny, the challenge is, you know, if tides turn, their timeline is up and they say, hey, we want to sell this whole portfolio. Well, our business is over, right? Like we no longer have any properties. 
Um, so how I've always looked at it is, as good business is, diversify into everything. You know, we'll continue to raise capital from individual accredited investors and fill that pipeline uh, while also chasing, you know, the larger institutional investors and, and try to do it where we're doing it side by side. Um, you know, we did our, uh, our first fund was primarily, um, actually exclusively with all retail investors and we raised $47 million dollars. This next fund, fund two, will be the idea that we may have an institutional partner doing a JV with our retail investors so that we have scale if we need it and we can continue to allow our retail investors to participate alongside of us. The fact that you chose a fund uh, structure tells me that you want to buy as many different types of assets under one fund umbrella as opposed to individual, you know, single asset uh, syndications or whatever. Um, why, why did you choose that structure? Is it because you wanted to scale? No, I, I think for, it, again, going back to the type of investor you have, for a retail investor this late in the cycle, and, and let's, let's pre-COVID this conversation, <laughs> yeah. because I, I would say that, you know, six months ago, we were all saying, hey, we're late, we're late, we're late, this correction's coming, right? And so the fund idea for us was, look, let's put our retail investors in a position where they're protected, right? You know, if, if you come, Brian, you invest $100,000 with us, if you come into one property, well, then your exposure is really strong to that specific market, that particular property's performance. And if we're late in the cycle and let's say something happens, there's some sort of correction where that market gets impacted, well, then, man, you're, you're going to be in a tough spot. You know, in fund one, we had 11 properties. So the idea is, you know, across four states. So the idea is, you know, if that one property gets impacted, well, you got 10 others to kind of buoy the performance, Right. Um, so really, the fund decision was made in, in the thought of how do we protect our retail investors while still allowing us to go out and get all different types of properties. So that's kind of why we did it. Um, typically, the larger investors, Brian, want nothing to do with a fund, um, primarily because they want to have decision-making ability on each asset you're buying, right? If you invest in a fund with us, you're buying into, there may be some seed assets that we're starting it with, you know, so you can see the portfolio, um, but you're trusting our acquisitions are going to be similar to that, you know, over the year that we're deploying capital. Well, an institutional investor is going to say, no, nah, we're not going to trust you. You know, you bring us every property you want to buy, we'll underwrite it individually and decide if we want to be a part of that asset. So, you know, typically they'll go in and um, decide, you know, build their own fund with, with their um, equity investments. So I think it's just a function of how you structure it um, for your investors. For us, the idea was um, not only does it protect investors, but administratively, it's much easier to manage 11 properties in one entity versus 11 different syndications, um, which we've done in the past too. We've done a lot of individual, you know, Reg D, 506B, 506C offerings, as well as um, doing the fund platform. Because you put it in the fund structure, does that then rule out the larger institutions from investing with you? And does that mean that you're, primar you're, you're primarily raising money from individual investors? Well, so how we structured it, and, and look, I'm not an attorney. <laughs> you should not trust any of my legal judgment at all. Um, you should spend the time and energy and money um, to have a fantastic uh, team who can review all of your thoughts. Um, but how we structured it, Brian, was the fund gives us the ability to do JV partnerships um, with you know, a large institution if we wanted or, or a 1031 exchange investor, right? Or um, essentially, it gives us the, the carte blanche to do however we want to structure it to allow people to come directly into deals that the fund may have invested with. And how that may look, right, is let's say, you know, we had a large family office who said, look, Chris, you know, we really like the, Lex, you know, Lexington, South Carolina market. We know that asset. We want to invest in that property, but I don't want the rest of your fund, but we'll put 2 million bucks into that property. And we'll say, okay, well, the equity requirement for this property is 4 million. So we'll take 2 million from the fund. They'll invest in it. And then two million from you, the investor, directly, and together you're doing that joint venture where you know you're taking the, the four million dollar um, equity requirement and block. So it's given us that structure to to be flexible, 
Um, in fund one, we didn't really, uh, we only had two JV investors and they were 1031 investors. And I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes unless you want to, but a 1031 investor has to invest directly in a property. They can't invest in a partnership. So uh, for your listeners who don't know, 1031 means um, it's, it's, I don't want to say a loophole, but it's a part of the tax code that allows you to roll over the gains from a previous sale into another real estate property and you don't have to pay any gain um, taxes on the gains of that property. So it's a really tax efficient way to continue to roll your money. Um, but there are a, a lot of rules on how you can do that. Um, so in fund one, we had a few properties where a 1031 investor came into two properties directly. Um, and then the fund investors were the other part of that equity. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so tell me, so thank you. And by the way, this is very interesting to me. I don't know if it's going to be, <laughs> I I'm sure there are other people out there who are, who are trying to wrap their head around putting together a fund because I, I've put together a fund and I'm doing other funds and just, the, it took me a year to figure out how to arrange it. So it made sense. And you ask 10 different people how to put together a fund and you get 10 completely different answers. But it sounds like your, uh, the way you've done it is your capital stack uh, uh, it can come from 1031 investors, institution, or the fund itself. Um, who actually controls each property? Is it the, the, does the fund take control and is it in the fund's name or is it in a separate LLC and the fund just partakes of that? You sure you want to go down this hole, Brian? I'm happy to do it, <laughs> but we maybe have people tuning out right now. They're All like, right, well, get, give me the quick guy, 20 second answer. And, and then uh, I've got another rabbit hole question for you. I, I can send you the org chart. We can share screens and start walking through the org chart if you'd like. Um, but it, essentially what happens is, so you have this LLC that's sitting at the top. Let's call it, you know, in the last fund, it was called Reliance Self Storage Fund 1. And each one of those um, under there is a single purpose entity for each of the properties the fund is buying. Everything rolls up into this sole member. Let, let's, let's assume just for the sake of argument, there's no JVs. So you have all these properties that have one sole member and that's Reliant Self Storage Fund 1. And in Reliant Self Storage Fund 1, we have, again, I'm, we're going to go deep. We're, we have Reliant Investments Fund 1 and we have Reliant Fund Manager 1. And in there is essentially the people in Reliant that maintain all the controls. So when we buy, when we sell, if we have to make a capital call, refinance, all of that is done with those two entities, which run Fund 1 and Fund 1 in turn owns all the entities underneath it. Does that make sense? Yes. And believe it or not, I think a lot of our listeners will get value from that, that answer. I hope they do. <laughs> so, and I, I certainly did. Um, the, another deep in the weeds question, but I, but is important to me is uh, it's, you must have a number of investors. Uh, how do you keep track of all those investors who I'd imagine are investing at different times throughout the life of the fund? I, have you figured out, I, I, I'm sure you have, but how did you figure out how to keep track of all these investors when they got in and, and how to make sure that they are compensated accordingly uh, for that? Well, I think what you're describing is, are you talking about like, how do you create like a fair market value of the share that they're investing? Well, is that how you're doing it? Are you basically as, as a new investor comes in, you're, you're valuing the shares that they're buying at that particular point in time? In our first fund, we did not do it that way, Brian. We had kind of the, the genesis of creating the fund was, as I had mentioned, we thought we were late in the cycle, but we also had a glut of acquisitions opportunities where we had you know, we ended up with 11 properties in the fund. Six of them were there when we launched the fund. So we had more property than equity. So what we did is we essentially put our own cash out to hold these properties until we could raise the equity to buy them. So as an investor, you knew the majority of what you were buying day one, like 60 plus percent of the 50 million, or the, we ended up raising $47 million, but 60 plus percent of that was known. It wasn't a blind pool. And then as we went along, our acquisitions team added another five properties. We actually started with 10. We removed four and put in another five. Sorry, don't, don't mean to get too much in the math. Mm -hmm. So for us, 
the, the share value day one is the same as, you know, we did it in about eight months. So it was very, a pretty quick turn of raising the capital and deploying it. If we went so, so does that mean all of your investors came in at the same value? Correct. We had different classes of shares based on how much you invested, um, but they came in at the same value. Um, the only difference being your preferred return, if you were dollar one into the fund, your preferred return accrued started to accrue earlier than if I was the last dollar in the fund. Yeah. So you get that a prorated sense. preferred return based on w- when you came in during the year. You got it. Now, more typical funds, Brian, where you're deploying, you're raising capital and then deploying it over two or three years, how they're doing it is, you know, a fair market um, estimate. So on a quarterly basis, sometimes semi-annually, they're evaluating the, the value of the portfolio and then selling shares based on that. And as the portfolio builds, you know, arguably the shares should get more expensive um, so that people coming in later, you know, year two, are not paying the same price as the people day one. That's a very helpful answer. Um, thank and you. what I would say there, Brian, is if you start to get into the fair market values, that's where third party and fund administrators really help um, because that can be a really, um, that it, it's a lot of work. It can be a lot of work and you need to be able to validate where those values come from. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, having gone down this road of looking into how to set up a fund and starting a fund myself, I know that it's it's a it's a lot of uh, mental power that goes into making sure that every investor is taken care of as far as when they got in, what the, their value of their their units or shares are. Um, so, yeah, you're right. A third party fund administrator would be a, a good idea. Well, I think the other thing it does too, right, is is your your investors can be confident that you're not cooking the books. I mean, mm-hmm. right, it's somebody else who's doing that. You know, if I were an investor, I'd be happy to pay for that service, right? That cost gets absorbed by the fund. And it just gives you another level of comfort that, you know, Brian's fund is not a Ponzi scheme. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, well, Chris, you, um, you have done me a great service by explaining all the in the weed things that I just asked you. So I want to give you the opportunity. Do you think anyone, do you think anyone is still listening or? <laughs> I think so. They better be, they better be. Um, I, I'm, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about Reliance Fund. I mean, you mentioned that you're starting a new fund, uh, $50 million. Tell us a little bit about that. As you mentioned, um, it's May 14th. So we launched the fund just about at the end of April and arguably the worst time ever to raise capital, um, you know, kind of in the depths of the pandemic. And, and really our, our crux of it is, you know, it will be, you know, think a mutual fund of self-storage properties. Um, we have three properties under contract right now that um, we're going to try to get closed here in Q2. Um, but essentially the idea is to allow investors to come in and invest across the portfolio properties, diversified across multiple states, multiple markets, um, and, um, you know, reap the benefits of the returns of self-storage. Um, you know, for us, part of it also is to be prepared for whatever may be coming, um, as a correction from this COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm not necessarily sure what that looks like, but, if there are some opportunistic buys to be had out there, we want to be prepared with capital to be able to deploy and go get them um, if they exist. So I think that will kind of shake out, you know, Q3, Q4 timeline. I think a big part of it is going to be what happens to the liquidity in the marketplace. Um, If liquidity starts to tighten and go away, you know, through the summer, COVID-19 gets worse and doesn't get better. Um, I think we're all in for a heck of a ride. Yeah. How important is liquidity to your fund? Are you paying all cash or are you bringing in um, different types of financing? No, we, everything's levered. Um, so typically we're shooting for 65% loan to value, 65 to 70. Our last fund was at 68% when you looked at the average across all 11 properties. So um, we're doing that to get the returns for our investors. Otherwise, if we bought it all cash, certainly would reduce the risk. Um, but we wouldn't be able to deliver the returns that most of our investors are asking for. And, you know, typically our investors are looking for kind of a mid teens type of range, depending on the types of properties that we're buying. So if it's a development property, you know, the fund's a little bit different um, because it's all mushed together, the portfolio. But if someone were to invest in a development, ground up development property, they're going to look for a higher return to supplement the risk that we're taking. Um, versus, you know, stabilized cash flowing asset where 
you know, we're going to buy a property that's 90% full and essentially has a very low execution risk. You know, typically people are going to say, hey, high single digits. We're pretty happy with that. So is that, um, is that internal rate of return or annualized return? Depends who you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say from an IRR standpoint, so the internal rate of return, you know, for our stabilized asset, we, we have three buckets of properties. So our stabilized assets, typically high single digits, low doubles, call it, you know, eight to 11. Um, our value add deals that have some execution risk associated with them, you know, 12 to 14 ish. Um, and then our development deals on an IRR, and this is all net to investor, post all fees, you know, splits, et cetera. And then our, our development deals, typically high teens, you know, we got to be showing somebody call it that 17 to 20 range before people are willing to take that risk with us typically. And you had mentioned, uh, you know, different types of shares, A shares, B shares. Are there different preferred returns for investors who come in at different levels? So how we've set up fund two is a class A, B, and C share based off investment minimums. Um, the pref is the same. So the preferred return is an 8% preferred return for all three shares. The difference is in the waterfall. Um, so what happens after we meet that 8% preferred return, how monies get split, um, it's more aggressive for the people investing more dollars. So, you know, maybe an 8% preferred return. Look, we can go for a class A share is an 8% preferred return with an 80 20 split, where a class C share um, is a 8% preferred return with a 70 30 split. So you're getting 10% more ownership um, if you're investing more dollars. And actually, what we did, Brian, um, for fund two is we realize right now is a tough time to raise money, right? Because people are, waiting. They want to see what happens. Um, so for the first $10 million in the fund, everybody's getting a class A share, whether you're you know, a $50,000 investor or a million dollar investor. Um, we're saying, look, everybody comes in at that class A share until we hit that 10 million threshold. And then it goes back to the individual investment minimums. Tell us a little bit about Reliance team. I know that the, the team is important to making all this work. What positions are on your team that kind of has helped ensure Reliance success? Well, we got a bunch of them. Um, you know, I would say you're absolutely right. I, me as an investor, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that you invest in the people first. Um, the real estate is somewhat secondary, right? So, you know, you can have a great real estate project and a bad team and you can drive that project in the ground or you can have a terrible project that the team's really good and it will end up doing okay. So a big part of it is that's who you're investing in really because you have no control over anything else as a passive investor. So, you know, uh, our managing principal, Todd Allen, he's for all intents and purposes, the CEO, all those titles, managing principal, you know, Todd comes from a, a, a 20 plus year background in self storage. He worked for the nation's largest self storage REIT, uh, private REIT, um, simply self storage and, you know, acquired over 200 properties in his time there prior to starting Reliant. Um, we, we bought our first property in 2007. So we've had a, a pretty substantial run um, we have an acquisitions team. Um, our director of acquisitions lives in Tampa, Florida. Has he's a uh, actually started his business in, in the appraisal world, and then did a lot of self storage work. Um, and then it just made sense because he had done a lot of work for us to come over and manage direct acquisitions. Um, we have our director of an analytics who sits in the office across from me, um, and you know he's been here ten plus years. So those are the guys really driving the boat as far as what we're looking at. Um, we have a, a director of operations. Um, he actually came from Walmart, um, was a, an operations guy there, um, has been great at managing the team. Remember, at our corporate office, we have, you know, it depends on the day, 15 to 18 people. But, you know, we have 130, 140 employees out in the field. Majority of them are running the facilities. And so our ops team is really, you know, directives that we have at the corporate level is driving those down through the individual facilities. Um, and then, um, you know, on the construction side, um, we have an internal project management team, a, a gentleman who um, has been in self-storage construction for 30 years. He came from Simply Self Storage, actually where Todd was. Um, we stole him away, I don't know, two years ago. Um, so he manages all the, uh, the construction components of our value add deals or ground up or CapEx expansion or uh, capital expenditures that we're doing on the site. So you know, we have a pretty robust um, team. And then obviously the accounting and, and marketing function, our CFO is a great guy, um, manages our accounting team. Um, and then marketing, we do a little bit of that internally. And then we also outsource a lot um, just to get a little bit more scale from what we can do individually. So really, I think it's everybody kind of, 
you know, playing their role. And we're still a small company relative to a big company. <laughs> so everybody does a little bit of everything, um, depending on what needs to be done. But, you know, I think if you can find a group who's all rowing in the same direction, um, it, it's a good, it's a good spot to be in. Chris, how would people get a hold of you if they wanted to do so? Yeah, I think there's a couple of ways. Um, you know, if you want to learn more about the platform and, and what we're doing, track record, bios on the team members, there's some education component. You can go to reliantinvestments.com. Um, it's a website uh, that uh, gives a, a nice overview from the investing side of things. And we'll share with you uh, some of the, the property performances over the years, individual case studies. We do a lot of education on there too, um, blogs, that kind of stuff. So you can go to reliantinvestments.com. If you're trying to connect with me personally, LinkedIn is really the social media medium that I use the most. Um, my name's Chris with a K. So it's K-R-I-S-B-E-N-S-O-N. If you, if you search that with Reliant, I'm sure you'll find me. We post videos on there, some fun stuff, some educational stuff, um, you know, from time to time and, um, and what we're working on. I think either of those are probably reasonable. Great. And any final thoughts or advice for our listeners? I think it depends on what you're trying to do right at. You know, the, the things that have always guided me well is um, you have to jump in at some point. Um, so if you're making a change, and, and I've done lots of that, um, you're not going to have all the answers until you get in the middle of it. Um, and that's where you're going to do your best learning. So, you know, for me, I think that's one thing is, is if you're analyzing and um, you're on the sidelines, you can do that for the next five years, and then you may have missed your opportunity. So, I think one thing for me is um, be opportunistic and and jump in, be willing to take that risk. And and look, if you make a mistake, it's okay. It's a good learning experience. And you just be, um, you, you don't have to know, this is what I tell my 18 year old, you don't have to know where you're going. You just have to know what's next. Go and do that and then be opportunistic while you're there. If something pops up, go jump and do that because I'm still not sure what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> well, you're doing great so far. Chris, I want to, I want to thank you for, taking the time to talk about self-storage. It's really interesting to get your perspective being from a larger group, a larger fund, and you know the scale at which you've been doing self-storage um, is very impressive. And, and I, I want to thank you too for getting in the weeds with me on the questions about actually creating a fund and, and the structuring of that fund. And uh, uh, great luck with your, your raising that $50 million. Well, I appreciate that and I appreciate you asking. It's uh, always fun to talk to uh, somebody like-minded. And yeah, it's, uh, if people have additional questions, by all means, reach out. We'll do our best to, uh, to help you however we can. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.